Good afternoon, nerd friends. Welcome back to the Nerd Bench. Today, we're going to talk about soldering. One of the lost arts of the RC world, if you will, and something that we run into all the time on the tech support lines is basic issues that can come from basic soldering problems. And we're going to talk about some of that stuff today. And I'm going to wire up this shiny new Max 5G2 with some series plugs on it because that's another topic of conversation that comes up is what's the difference in how we set up for dual battery packs or single battery packs. So we'll get right into that next. First and foremost, the equipment that you need for this task, uh, some decent uh, wire strippers is what I always say, uh, some wire cutters, a vice grip, and I use this just for holding the plugs. And if you don't have all that, we'll, we'll show you some other stuff as well in case you don't have you know the fancy tools. So up first, let's talk about a dual battery pack versus single battery pack setup. If you're gonna run multiple battery packs, that can be done on most of the speed controls. Even if it's like a 4S speed control, you can set it up to run dual 2S battery packs in series. It's pretty straightforward once you've seen it done once or twice. So we'll talk about that real quickly here. So dual battery pack setups can be done kind of two ways. One is series, which is kind of more common these days where you take like two two cells to make it into a four cell or two three cells to make it into a six cell, something like that. And it involves wiring up the speed control for series connection. Parallel is something that's out there to increase capacity. It's not ultra safe with LiPos if you have them unequal in charge or capacity, you can run into some problems. So that's not super common, but the series situation um, for the purposes of multiplying voltage is pretty common and still has the same basic risks that the wire, the batteries have to be equal capacity and performance and life and all that sort of stuff. So you keep, keep all of that in mind before you go trying to do stuff like this. Now, a basic series wiring connection is pretty straightforward. You have the negative of a one plug on the negative wire of the speed control, the positive of the other plug on the positive of the speed control, and then you take the two remaining terminals and you connect them with a jumper wire. I, for most of the big power setups, you gotta make sure that your plug surface that you're soldering your wire to is at least bigger than the wire. If the wire is a lot larger than the surface that you're, you're soldering to, or if your plug material is smaller than the wires that you're using, that's not enough plug for the amount of power that these systems are gonna be passing. So that's something to keep in mind. A lot of problems with like T-plugs, uh, EC style plugs, uh, Traxxas plugs and stuff like that because the metal is actually less surface area or less material than the wire that we're soldering to. So if that's the case, there's a brand out there called Amas. They've been around for many years. They make several different types of these XT style of plugs. This is an XT90. This is a QS8 or wait, yeah. This is a QS8S and they're basically huge bullet plugs that are put into housings that they make them pretty easy to solder to. And I say that because this isn't a tube that you're soldering to. This is like a, a cup. So the wire will sit in there. You can get the wire right down onto the surface of the material and do a nice fancy solder joint that way. When there's a tube involved, sometimes the wire will float around inside that tube and you'll end up with a lot of solder between the wire and the connector itself. And that makes for a very bad connection in case you didn't. Now, before we get into this, if this is the first time you watched a solder video or a soldering video for everyone else that's out there, uh, don't forget, I'm going to put more videos in the link down below so that you can see some other takes on all of this. But also, in the same regard, watch lots of soldering videos if you've never soldered before. It'll help you kind of pick up a lot of subtle little things that you need to know about. Um, for example, one of the big things that we talk about all of the time is the iron itself. The fancy soldering irons are nice to have. This is a very old Haku handle that has a chisel tip on it. I want to say it's the four or five millimeter tip. I use this guy for most of my soldering duty. And you see it's got a lot of miles on it. That's why it looks the way that it does. The soldering station, the base, if you will, this is an old Haku uh, 928, but Haku is a brand that's been around for a long time. There's lots of other options that are out there. That little TS100 does a great job. The temperature range that we're looking at in Fahrenheit, 750 to around 950 degree operating range. That's probably 
40 to 60 watt basic iron but i mean if you're getting into doing custom rigs do yourself a favor get yourself a nice soldering iron that has a decent size tip on it so that you don't have to worry because you can put a smaller tip on you can put a bigger tip on there, there's lots of different options out there for making the soldering iron work for you and then the other one that i always try to tell folks i got my nice black i get a piece of cardboard and i do most of my soldering on top of a piece of cardboard so that when the solder splashes and stuff like that i don't melt holes in my table because nobody nobody wants that the the solder that I use this most of the time when you run in to get solder you're gonna get lead free solder if you get lead free solder there's nothing wrong with it just make sure you also get some flux to go along with it flux paste is easy a little flux liquid is fine too you're gonna to want to get electronic solder as well there's plumbing solder out there you don't want that rosin core if you're going to get it the leaded solder is pretty hard to find these days uh, my local hobby shop still is able to get this minitronic stuff so uh, that's a brand that has been around for a while they're still on the shelves out there but leaded solder is something that they're they've pushing out of electronic production internationally because it's bad for the earth for what we're doing here just making good connections it's usually not too much hassle i've had this spool of solder from the hobby from jake's performance hobby shop for years now i think so it, it lasts a while uh, I like to clamp these guys either into a little vise or if you don't have a vise, get yourself a small set of vise grips. These can be fantastic for doing installs. When you have the speed control installed already, ha having the wire, something easy for either someone either to, to hold the plug for you to do the soldering and all they have to do is hold it in position, not worry about how tight they have to hold it, stuff like that, can be a lifesaver. And if you're doing bench top stuff like we're doing here, this guy makes a wonderful clamp. I can do all this sort of stuff one-handed. The It'll sit there and I can solder. So we'll get into all this. That and first thing I like to do is install the connector on the speed control itself. And Something you may want to consider is to the, the all the wires come pre-tinned. Sometimes it'll be easier to remove that and start fresh with a new tin job. We're gonna try it this way and I'm gonna show you one of my other secret wire stripping techniques. What I'm doing here is this solder or this plug has that much area in there. So I wanna to try to get all of the wire surface in there and you see it's a little bit short. So I'm gonna strip off a little more until I get all the way up in there. So to right about there. And then this guy with a, this is a dull X-Acto knife. And the reason I use a dull X-Acto or a dull knife is so that it doesn't cut the strips of the, or the strands of wire that are in there. So that when I peel this guy off, the, uh, you don't get those frayed leads and all that good time. So did a pretty good job there. Give that guy a nice firm twist. And then I'm going to come in here, tin this guy up. I try to... Uh, make sure that my wires don't go like this when I tin them because the, the solder will run down into the wire and it makes for poor connection. You want to kind of use as little solder as you can but still use enough if that makes any sense. And too much solder can be bad, not enough can be bad. So it's one of those fine arts, so to speak. So when I do wire tinning, I try to get it flowing get everything. It'll get up to temperature pretty quick here because this is all very high gauge or high quality wire and then feed the solder in and let gravity do the work of getting the solder down the wire. So that way we're just kind of getting a little bit on the outside, not super soaking the wire or anything like that. Give it a little twist so that I get kind of solder all the way over. And a big part of this, like I said, is just to keep the, the wire from the frays happening so that when you go to lay this into wherever it needs to go, you don't get errant strands of wire looping out and doing all sorts of bad stuff to your connections. So there we go. And you'll see the solder will start to flow and then you'll get it to just roll around. So right there and then off on the side, let me show you this real quick just before I forget. The solder base has a sponge for cleaning the tip. So you go, and this thing's filthy by the way, you, so you can keep the, the contamination off of the tip. There's different ways to do that. Some folks say that the wet sponge isn't bad. It lowers the temperature, but for high temperature stuff, I got them cranked up to like 850, I think right now. It, it doesn't tend to hurt it, it heats right back up. And then this guy, check again, it's just a little bit bigger than it needs to be, which is probably gonna be okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let that slide. And then to make this side the same, I'm gonna do that right now, just to get that out of the way. Again, just feeding in the solder while the temperature equalizes. 
And as it gets up on top there, you'll see it kind of change the color, the sheen changes on the solder. And that's when it starts to flow and you can start to roll everything around and a little bit more. Don't worry, I'm gonna hold these up to the camera here in a second. You'll see what we're talking about with all this. Alrighty. So, cool that guy off over here. And we'll take a look, let's make sure I did these right. You see you get, you can still see the strands of wire. The solder's not like blobbed on there super heavy. And uh, there you go. There's a little bit of extra solder on that one just from when I was finishing up. But, so you can still see the strands and it's not like a bubble of solder. So these guys are marked for polarity. We're gonna start out, we'll do the, it doesn't really matter which one you do first or second, but we'll do the negative wire first. Uh, another thing that I like to do when I'm working with plugs is to plug in an empty one on the other side and it helps to kind of act as a heat sink so this guy doesn't soak all the heat out of everything. And it gives you a nice place to put your vice grips. So on XT style plugs, the skinny side is, is the negative side if you're looking at the taper, but they're also marked down here as well for extra safety. If you got sensitive fingers and the wires get hot while you're holding them, which they often do, <laughs> I had a guy tell me once, he's like, the only thing I don't get on your videos is how you can hold the wire as long as you do. And I'm like, wow, I've, I've burned the sensation out of my fingers. So a pair of a decent needle nose. I like the ones that are spring-loaded too, that, go the, that stay shut. Those are great to use as like a, a little vice grip also. So I'm gonna show two different types of installation here when we, when we do all this. And the reason being is because there's some different ways that you can solder wires and get good connections. Using, tinning everything first can be a little problematic because you're introducing solder into the connection between the, the wire and the material itself, and that's not ideal. So the, the, that's why this right amount becomes such an important factor here. So I am gonna do this first one, tinning this guy down. All right, so with this guy, hit it with a little bit of solder before we go in there. Now that I got the plug spot tinned in, and we'll lay this guy down with a little bit of pressure and then a touch more solder on top. And the idea is you want to get all the solder to flow so that this wire pushes down through the plug or through all that solder that I put in there onto the surface of the plug itself. And that is not cooperating at all. I can see, there we go. Get this guy flowing just a little bit more down in here. Bring this guy over. Big old power wires not wanting to flow that solder very well. So there we lay that guy down in there. And I'm not done. I got to let this guy cool off. Let the iron heat back up. Because when you're using big wire like this, it sucks a lot. Like this guy is good and hot right now. It'll pull a lot of the heat out of the wire or out of the soldering tip and it makes it not want to flow the solder. So you take a break for a minute or two. This guy's got a heat lamp indicator on it. So it tells me when, the, uh, when it's heating or when it thinks it's up to temperature. Uh, so once it starts, the light starts blinking, that means it thinks it's up to temperature. And this guy heats up pretty quick, but they're all a little bit different. Hit it with some fresh solder, and then I just lay this guy down. And then primarily what I'm trying to do is get the downward pressure on the wire to get that guy all the way into the plug. All right. And I'm looking at the bottom there to make sure that the wire isn't sitting up in some solder. That's pretty much all the way down there. That's about as far down as I'm going to get that guy. Wires making good contact all the way through. I did get one little flyer of a strand right there, so I'm gonna flick that out. Ow, that's hot. I'm gonna flick that out of there. And I'm just gonna put a little bit more, uh, make it look nice, solder on the top of that. And always applying like a little bit of downward pressure on that wire to make sure that it doesn't start to float. All right, so that side is done. Plug number one completed. So that's, like I said, oh, look what you did. I forgot the insulator. 
now I got to unsolder that and put the insulator on. Great. So I'm going to flatten the wire out just a little bit. And that's another nice thing about having the cardboard here. You have a, a decent surface just to mash wires around if you need to, knock solder off, stuff like that. Get that guy back in there, apply the heat, start with some solder, a little downward pressure, and we're back. It's very hot. So it is just a little bit exposed there. So another pro trip, if you pull on the insulation, like you pinch it back here and give this a little neck forward, you'll skinny that guy out just a little bit to bring him in there to give yourself a little extra, little extra leeway. So another reason I like to use the, the extra plug there is because this stuff all takes a lot of heat. That's a lot of temperature we're applying on there for a decent amount of time. And it stops you from melting the plastic or deforming the plug in there. So that, that can be very important as well. We're going to move on to the positive side. And this one we're going to do a little bit different. Uh, I'm not going to tin this surface. We're just going to add solder on top, and we'll see how that goes. Because it's basically the same idea, but now I won't have to melt that solder on the bottom. This same technique can be done without tinning the wire as well, the non-tin style. I've, I've, never, I've never been a big, huge fan of this, but I've seen it done a few times now. I've done it once or twice myself, and it's, it works fine. It's just different. We don't always like different around here. I did it again. I bumped the camera. Sorry. So a little bit of solder applies in there. Actually, we're going to do it a lot. Get that guy pushed downward. And we're going to give the iron a second to catch up here. Because these are big wires. Everything's heat sinking a lot. Of oh, I did it again. I forgot the insulator. Jeez, I'm so excited to solder. You know what, this guy looks like he's just a little bit too long, so we're going to cut this down just a fuzz. All right, let that cool off for a second. So I'm letting the wire cool down a little bit, letting the plugs cool down a little bit, and we're letting the, the, the iron get back up to temperature. I'm going to hit this with a bit more and just kind of fill in the gaps here to make sure that the wire can't get out of there because I you're using the solder now to hold the wire in place because the contacts are all in that bare area ooh, 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 that was a hot one so I'm just checking the bottom out and you see you get a nice little flow uh, you can't you probably can't see that but there is uh, the, the little fill gap in there is all nicely done now. So the so you got a speed control now that has two plugs on it. And we're going to go ahead and tie in this series connection. Uh, same thing again. I think we're going to strip these just a little bit back just to get a little more surface area in there. So you can just roll. Like I said, this is a dull knife so that it tries not to cut the insulation. Do the same thing on this side. Take that off. And then these guys, we're just going to go ahead and hard solder these guys in there with the... We're going to slide this through the insulator first this time so we don't forget. Get that guy in there. Get our nice clean iron at the ready. And then we're going to just start feeding her. Doesn't like to start that process, that's for sure. Until the... The plug gets up a little bit of temperature. The solder really doesn't like to flow. So it does take a little bit of time on these big guys like this. So there, we're going to let that cool off for just a second. Let the iron recoup. I'm starting, I'm starting to really burn my fingies, so we might have to bust out the, the, the needle nosers. Get that guy down into position. And I'm pushing... Twisting and pushing downward with the, the needle nose at the same time to get that to sit all the way up in there. I do want to fill that in just a little bit more just to get that gap filled in. I don't like the way this guy's looking over here. A little bit of solder. And a little bit more pressure. There we go. That looks better. All right, so same thing like before. We kind of like just tack it into place. 
and lets everything kind of get up to temperature a little bit because the solder doesn't really want to flow on this guy to, to kind of hold them in place at all until it gets up to temperature a little bit so soldering is the is does have a little bit of patience involved that's for sure get this guy up in here and usually on the second go around once there's a little bit of solder up in here to spread the temperature around everything starts to do what it, and you can feel it and sort of hear it as the solder starts to flow the wire will start to move a little easier and you'll feel the iron kind of sink down in there as well this iron could be a little bit hotter also there we go it's very hot Drop this guy down in again. And I'm getting uh, the tip of the iron kind of almost into the opening of the plug to try to get as much of the wire down onto the surface of the plug as I can. Yeah, this iron has seen better days, that's for sure. Might be time for a fresh tip on this guy. You can see it's like the trees, uh, the ring of it on a tree, like it's down a couple layers. With a little bit of patience and a little bit of technique, we can kind of get where we need to be. It's just barely hot enough to get this job done. Oh, there we go. Nice flow, good grip on the wire. And we're in. So there we have some pretty decent connections, if I do say so myself. Nice even flow of solder front to back. We do an inspection down at the bottoms. That's where you can tell if you really got the, the flow all the way around is that those bottoms are seated in nicely. And we look to be good to go on all of those guys as near as I could tell. So that, I can click in my Quick recap. Uh, I do use a chisel or a, a large chisel tip iron for stuff like this. This iron is definitely not kind of up to snuff compared to where she used to be, that's for sure. It's time for a new tip and maybe a recalibration of the base. Uh, normally it's a little bit easier to do than what we saw there, but it gets the job done. The solder that I use, as I mentioned before, is lead-free, but I forgot it's a 6040 lead tin rosin core solder. So that's the normal kind of hand electronic solder that you're going to run into or solder like I said before for the international crowd but it's also pronounced aluminum depending on where you're from so who knows and also the real tip to all of this is to get the wire through the solder down onto the connector surface that makes a big difference in performance overall connector should be at least as big as the wire if not bigger to make sure that your connector doesn't turn into a resistor if you do have any questions comments or concerns please shoot us an email North America at hobbywing.com Com. We also do a podcast. It's called RC Stuff Powered by Hobby Wing. Each and every episode, we give away a free Hobby Wing combo. To find out how to enter to win, all you have to do is listen to an episode. Just look up RC Stuff on your favorite podcast service. And as always, folks, thanks for tuning in. Another fresh episode of The Charlie Show, new every Tuesday, right here on the Hobby Wing official YouTube channel. We will see you all next time.